we just finished up Cold War and going through detente and you know Vietnamization, the salt treaties, um, the idea of Perestroika and Glasnost and the opening up of the Soviet Union, China and Nixon, um, Reagan and Gorbachev, and uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall is really the one they, they, they want you to know. So as we wrap up Cold War and we just talk generally about some other foreign policy ideas on the test in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, really the 1970s, I guess, um, it's important just to know Yalta is the beginning of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union is the end. And just get that word down. If you can get these two words down, containment, stop the spread, and detente, which is the cooling off of the Cold War, and you get some of those events to write about, you know, I don't know which ones are best to write about. If you're going to do early, do Marshall and Truman, and then you could talk about Momo and um, the idea of where communism grows and um, enriching the soil of Western Europe. You can certainly go into uh, Cuba and do Bay of Pigs and Cuban Missile Crisis, or Korea and containment in Asia, or Vietnam, which there's a lot to write about. But definitely be ready to write about foreign policy. And remember, the overriding idea whenever we talk about foreign policy is whatever we do, who do you think we're doing it for? It's a great thesis to use. The United States, like all countries, like all human beings, acts in its self-interest. So whatever we're doing, we want you to be able to explain what's the self-interest involved. Um, when Washington lays down the isolationism um, speech in his farewell address, you know, the self-interest of why are we going to be isolated is because we don't want to get our, our, our arse whooped. We don't want to get, you know, we're the 98-pound weakling in a world of bullies. It's best to kind of go in the corner of the lunchroom for a little while. And then moving on to Monroe Doctrine and looking at why are we going to look at the hemisphere of Latin America as our hood. And then thinking about, okay, maybe it's time to keep the Europeans out, they're troublemakers. It's in our, what's the word? Uh, Self-interest. Belly rubbing. And for those of you on the other side of, uh, of the country who don't know what, what crazy Mr. Hughes is rubbing his belly for, um, I'm actually not hungry. I, I had lunch um, an hour ago. I'm illustrating imperialism. Um, and that's the hand signal, because the idea is that um, America is hungry. Industrialization caused hunger pangs, sugar, raw materials, new markets, military bases. Um, and, and that's our self-interest and containment alike. Uh, we believe in the domino theory. Therefore, containment serves our self-interest. It's always self-interest. Let's look at a couple of events in the 1970s, um, 1980s, and my brain is racing trying to think what, what's important to go over. Um, it's not really Cold War, but is on the test. Well, one that's for sure is uh, the Iranian hostage crisis. Um, and, you know, everything's involved with the Cold War. I can't say it's, it's, it's not Cold War, but it's not containment in that sense. So let's go over the history of that, and then maybe we could talk a little bit about Israel in the Middle East and um, Carter, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. But these are on the test, and these are in the 40s. We call them the uh, woeful 40s. When uh, kids get more questions wrong than they get right, and uh, you kind of bottom out. And we don't want that to happen anymore. So um, hopefully by listening to these lectures and obviously doing your homework and being the studious, attentive students that you are, um, we'll, we'll be able to jump that hurdle and, and really not just pass the exam, but beat the exam with a baseball bat. So Iranian hostage crisis um, is at the end of Jimmy Carter's for, uh, first and only term. Um, Jimmy Carter was elected off the back of Watergate, which we're going to, I'm saving Watergate, baby. But um, he was the really president, elected president, um, in most historians' eyes, because of the fallout of Watergate. Um, we're just going to say for now, I'm saying I have six minutes, I could try Watergate. Um, wow, Pentagon Papers, I can't do that. Let's just say that Richard Nixon leaves in a scandalous disgrace in 1970, uh, uh, 1974. Um, and Vice President Gerald Ford takes over. And Gerald Ford was never elected to office. He um, actually wasn't the elected vice president. That was Spiro Agnew. You don't have to know this unless you're an AP student. And Spiro Agnew, who was vice president with Richard Nixon and uh, 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 had some tax problems, um, and he resigned from office, leaving a hole in the um, vice presidency. And now, because of the amendment procedure, we had taken care of that. And now um, the president gets to choose his next vice president with, with congressional approval. So he picks Gerald Ford. Um, and Gerald Ford uh, was a former football star, but he's a Republican. Um, big mistake. The first thing that Ford does 
Remember, what, what's that get-out-of-jail-free card the president has? There it is, the pardon. Ford pardons Nixon. Excuse me. And I think that that really set off a lot of Americans. And the Republican Party kind of sees its destruction in 1974 when Ford pardons Nixon. They really were where they are kind of now. Probably 20% of Americans said they were Republicans um, because of the scandal. You know, I, I don't want to do too much current analysis, but, you know, nobody can argue with the idea that Bush had a very low approval rating at the end of his presidency. You know, who wants to be associated with the losers of the world? Not that I'm calling Bush a loser, although I just did. Um, that's the concept, the analogy that we'll use. Bill O'Reilly's going to get me. Um, but trying to be fair and balanced. Um, so the idea here is, is that Jimmy Carter's elected off that scandal. That's actually a question sometimes. But Jimmy Carter um, is really being, is identified in, his, in, in historical books, really as being, at least in foreign policy, uh, um, not the strongest American president. And it goes to Iran hostage. Let's just backtrack a little bit. Um, Iran, um, the country that we now um, see as maybe a foe, building nuclear weapons perhaps, and really an enemy in our eyes of Israel, and borders Iraq, and they've caused problems in Iraq according to um, our military intelligence, um, has a long history. And we're not going to go back too far. We could go back to like, you know, 4000 BC and, you know, Mesopotamia. But we're going to stick to the 1950s. Look, Iran... Um, was part of the Cold War in the sense that we did interfere in their internal politics in the 1950s. The CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, had a hand in installing their leaders. And uh, one of those leaders, or the, the leader, was called the Shah of Iran. And definitely seen as an American puppet by, by, by many people in the world, and, and especially eventually by the Iranians themselves. I'm not saying that the Shah didn't do good things. Um, Iran became modern during that era, became westernized, and uh, women had rights, and I don't want to say they had all rights, people were beaten in the streets and, and bad things like that, but women could get MDs, and there was doctors and lawyers, and there was a sense of westernness. However, the secret police of the Shah were brutal in the way that they treated people that were protesters. They really didn't have freedom of speech in that sense. So by the late 70s, Iranians are kind of fed up. And their religious powerhouse, ours is kind of the Christian religious right, theirs is, and I'm not equating the two, they're not the same, um, Islamic fundamentalists. People who believe that society should be modeled on what the Koran says. So they want to go back to the basics in a sense. And there's different levels of these types of peoples. The Taliban who stone women in the, in the, in the soccer fields for um, committing adultery and things like that, to um, uh, Iran where, you know, you do um, have people that, are, that dress traditionally and cover their faces, and definitely the religious leaders control the strings of politics. So, in the late 70s, when this revolution occurred under Carter's watch, the Shah went running. And guess who took him in? We took him in. He had cancer, and we took him into a hospital, and Iran wanted him back. And that's my telephone. Be right back. I'm back. So, um, they were angry that we took the Shah in and that uh, we wouldn't return him, Carter wouldn't return him. So, the Iranian students that were involved in the revolution stormed the American embassy in Tehran and took 50 American hostages. And every day when you turned your TV on, guess what you saw? American hostages in Iran with guns to their head blindfolded in the streets. And everybody wanted Carter to resolve this situation, get the hostages out. People were tying yellow, um, yellow ribbons around trees, and the country was in an uproar. And we, we really wanted, you know, not only uh, the hostages, but we wanted resolution and justice. And Carter couldn't do it. Failed mission of helicopters, crashed in the desert. He, diplomacy wouldn't work. He didn't want to invade and start a, a war. And um, it ended up that uh, they didn't release them to the day that Ronald Reagan took office in January 20th, 1981. So they were there for 444 days. And that's seen as the demise of Carter, why he lost the election. So that's kind of important to know. Um, really quick, you just want to make sure that you understand um, peace in the Middle East is on the test with the Camp David Accords. That vocabulary, the Camp David Accords, is associated with Carter's success in foreign policy. Egypt and Israel made a deal. Israel is a very hated country among Arab countries because they were created out of a country that existed called Palestine. I'm not going biblical, guys, because there's a long history there. But Palestinians that used to live there and other Arab countries see enemy uh, uh, Israel as an enemy. 
So, um, the Camp David Accords are important because at least it's one Arab country, Egypt, which has made peace with Israel. And that continues to today in terms of tensions and um, the hotspot of the world being in the Middle East. I think I have to go.